chapter 6 Jesus teaches us and he says when we pray we must say our father who art in heaven we've been doing that series as a church this morning Pastor Tobejane encouraged us last week the Lord sent him back again this morning so this morning we have got our brother our friend that's his name is one of the leaders here in church He's going to be speaking to us again this morning. I'm going to pray as he comes to the front. Lord, we want to thank you this morning that Jesus, we have the opportunity to hear from you, O oh Lord, through your servant here, O oh Father. You spoke to our hearts, Heavenly Father, through the prayers and the songs that, that we sang this morning. The prayers that we prayed, O oh Lord, you encouraged us, O oh Father. Heavenly Father, here we are going to receive your word through your servant. We pray that Jesus, you give him the boldness, O oh Lord, to declare you are where Heavenly Father as you see fit. He has prepared, mighty God, he's got notes, O oh dear Heavenly Father. We still pray that your spirit, O oh Lord, will fill him, O oh Father. Your spirit, O oh dear Jesus, will give him the words, will string the words together, Lord, into sentences. That Heavenly Father, as your word reaches our hearts, will be able to receive your heart, your word, O oh Lord and make it work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, greetings, saints. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, once again, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, privilege to stand here. I'm not sure what's happening with my eyes, so pardon me. Um, so, we, we continue, as Pastor Dombo has mentioned, that we, we have been on this series where we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we've been in the book of Matthew chapter 6, and we have been going through verse, <coughs> verse by verse and speaking on the Lord's Prayer. And the idea behind it is simply to, to get us to a point where all of us are in agreement with what the Word of God is saying about what Jesus was actually teaching his disciples. Um, teaching his disciples and teaching us. Amen. So what we want to understand is everything that has been said in this prayer, what, what, does, it, what, what does he say, what does he mean when he says, our father, is God our father? As Pastor Dombo uh, preached very well on, on, on that part. God is our father. And I want us to go to the book of Matthew chapter 6 this morning as we continue uh, to read. Last week we were in verse 12. But I want us to read up to verse 13 today, which is where we are this morning. Hallelujah. So let us, let us go into the book of Matthew chapter 6, and then we will read together as we continue this morning. And I want us to uh, just quickly open it for us. Um, as we focus our attention on verse 13, I want us to um, just do a bit of a recap on, on where, we, where we, we have been in terms of this series. When we read from verse 8, it says, Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. <laughs> this, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive, oh, okay, I'll stop there for now. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. That is where our focus is going to be this morning. Last week we, we spoke about uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We spoke about that last week. And today I want us to continue in verse 13. 
And verse 13 is another one of those uh, portions of scripture that I think we need to pay close attention to in order for us to properly be able to understand what it means and what is, what is said in this part of, of scripture. It's a very short verse, you know, like the many others we have been through. But if we do not grasp its meaning, we are, we are going to do what James talks about when he says, you pray amiss. You know, you are asking God for something that you're supposed to be doing, for example. It's one of those places where you could be praying and you're saying, Lord, uh, you know, help me do one, two, three. But God is saying, but what I have said to you is you should be doing one, two, three. And so it is very important for us to understand this part of scripture. And I want us to just go into it with an open mind and begin to look at what God is saying to us as we read together this morning. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from the evil one. And others, other versions would say, deliver us from evil. From the onset, when we read this portion of scripture, from the onset, in the, the, earlier, verses, the, the, the earlier verses, excuse me, the earlier verses when we read, we read about give us, what? This day, our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, we are asking God to provide for us. And we understand that from what we said was that God is our provider. And when we say, give us this day our daily bread, we are acknowledging God as our source and as our provider. And we depend entirely on him. When we come to this verse, instead of us saying, give Lord, we are asking you to give us. We are seemingly saying, keep this thing away from us. <laughs> we, are, we are not praying something to come to us, but we are praying for something to stay away from us. Lead us not in to temptation. So the, the idea is that we don't want anything to do with this thing called temptation. And therefore we are asking God to say, Lord, we want you to not lead us into this thing. We don't want to do, we don't want anything to do with this thing. Lead us not there. Lead us elsewhere. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in green pastures. But this is not a green pasture. So don't lead me into this thing. I don't want to go into this thing. That is what Jesus is saying to the disciples as he teaches them how to pray. He's saying, as you pray, <laughs> pray that God will not lead you into this thing, into temptation and deliver you from evil as part of your prayer. But then the question becomes, if we are asking God not to lead us into temptation, does it mean then that temptation is something that we should not experience in our lives? Does it mean then that we should not go through temptation? Does it mean then that our lives should be free from temptation? Is it something that is wrong to experience or to go through or to encounter in our experiences in life? If we are asking God to not lead us there, it means we don't want it. Because if, you, if we want it, we say, lead us into greener, greener pastures. If we, want it to, if we want it, we say, give us this day our daily bread. But here we are saying, don't lead us there. But then the assumption could be, then it means we are, temptation is something that we should be insulated from. We should be insulated from temptation. In other words, our lives should be Free of temptation. <laughs> is that what it's, what, it's, what it's said? Is, is that what he's saying? Our lives should be free from temptation. We should be completely and entirely insulated. And temptation should be on the one side and we should be on the other side. It should not touch us at all. But when we begin to read, we begin to understand something 
that Jesus is actually trying to convey as, he's, as he, he, he teaches his disciples to pray. And I want us to go together in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 1. And we are trying to get to a point where we, we, we want to establish, firstly, are we supposed to be insulated from temptation? Are we supposed to be completely insulated from it? It says, Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, it says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a, in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. So it seems that being tempted is part and parcel of a believer's life. Is part and parcel of our, our lives. Maybe, maybe even before we go there, let's, let, let's try and, and uh, understand what it is to, to be tempted. What is temptation? Well, let's start there. Maybe I went ahead of myself. What is temptation? When we talk about temptation, we are talking about a situation where one is enticed to do something evil. You are enticed or lured to do something that is sinful, something that is wrong. That is what temptation is. You are dragged or led to do something that is evil. And often temptation is wrapped in nice packages. Because the purpose of temptation is to lead you ultimately to entice you to sin. The purpose of temptation is to entice you to sin. But how temptation happens is that it makes you believe a lie and see a lie as truth. Temptation makes us think that what we are looking at is what is all that there is. It's like wrapping up poison in a in a packet of sweet a, 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 a sweet cover, you know, to entice someone to say, no, no, this is a sweet. It's very nice, but when you open it and you start eating it, it kills you because it's poison. That's what temptation is. It's it, it's it's an enticement to do what you are not supposed to do. And then he says he continues to say. Um, in, in, in chapter 6 verse 1 it says watch yourselves or you will be tempted amen and then we read in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 I will read for us uh, for the purposes of time because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted Hebrews 4 15 it says for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so what we are looking at here is that uh, the Bible in the book of Hebrews is beginning to tell us about the fact that Jesus himself was tempted. And so if Jesus himself as our Lord was tempted, what does that say? Lead us not into temptation does not mean that we should be insulated from temptation. It means that temptation will be part and parcel of our walk with God. But what we do when we are tempted is what matters. It's not the temptation itself. It will come. Jesus himself was tempted. He went into the wilderness. He was led into the wilderness. And when he was there, what happened? He was tempted by the enemy. And therefore, what it means is that when we say, Lord, lead us not into temptation, we are not saying, Lord, insulate us away from temptation. Because if we begin to think that God is saying, uh, Jesus is saying, insulate us away from temptation, what happens is that we live our lives with that kind of understanding and we are misled. And therefore, to not be misled, we need to understand that what he's saying is that temptation will be there in your life on a daily basis, on an ongoing basis. But what you do when you are tempted is what is important. He says about Jesus, um, who, who, who uh, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet did not sin. The ultimate goal of temptation is to lure you into sin. It's to entice you and paint a beautiful picture about something that will lead you to sin and make you believe it. That is the whole intention of 
temptation. And it does not happen only once. You know, we read about the temptation of Jesus. The Bible says he was tempted in every way. And when we look, when we read it in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 13, at the end of his temptation, listen to what it says. It says, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. <laughs> so the devil is always looking for an opportune time to tempt us to lure us into the things that will lead us into sin. So what we understand is, what we need to understand this morning is that that's the first thing, that sin, um, temptation is not something that we should be insulated from. We know in our lives there's different temptations that we come across on a daily basis. So it's not, it's not a new thing. We know that. But we need to have that understanding as we pray, lead us not into temptation. First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5, I will read, we, we, I will provide the notes, I'm, I'm just looking at the time, uh, from verse, chapter 3 verse 5, it says, For this reason, when, when I, could, I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way, the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. So Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and he's saying to them, I am concerned that whatever that we have done, the work we have done with, with you, I am concerned that the tempter might have tempted you and misled you. Then who is the tempter? You know, who is the tempter? Because we are asking God, do not lead us into temptation. But the question then becomes, who is the tempter? Then the, we understand the tempter in this case is that the enemy, the devil. Satan himself is the tempter. He is the one who tempts, who brings about temptation in our lives in order to move, away, move us away from God through sin. He is the tempter. And so when Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, it is because this thing has got the devil wrapped around it. This thing called temptation is written the devil everywhere you look at it. And the enemy, Satan, the person we are talking about here, he is the enemy of God. And so when he says when you pray, ask that God will not lead you into temptation, we'll talk about that. But when he's saying, what he's saying is that when we get to temptation, we are talking about Satan. We are talking about this guy who wants to destroy you. The Bible talks about how the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that is all that he is about. He is coming to, to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is, what he's, that is what he is here to do. And so when we read in James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. And so we understand that already we, 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 we isolate the fact that God does not tempt us. <laughs> but who tempts us? The tempter is the devil. <laughs> we are tempted by the enemy. So that we can do what pushes us away from God. So that we can do the things that displease God. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. The purpose of temptation, as I've already mentioned, is very clear. It's to kill, to destroy. Ultimately with sin. To lead you into sin. To tempt you into sin. To lead you into doing something that does not please God. And the enemy, Peter says about it, he says, Be alert and of, of, of a sober mind. For your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking around, he's busy throwing temptation in and throwing temptation here and there to make sure that we are devoured by him, destroyed basically by him because he's come to kill, steal and destroy. That's who he is. So, who tempts? Lead, uh, lead us not into temptation. Who tempts? 
Satan tempts, the devil tempts. God tempts no one as we read uh, in the book of James. God does not tempt us by evil. And I want us to just look further into that point. That God does not tempt us by evil. God does not tempt us. When we read in the book of Exodus, or rather, let's just start in the book of James, where we are, chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. It says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, and wherever, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your, of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then in Exodus it says, Moses said to, Exodus 20 verse 20, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. I'm trying to bring home a point about the fact that the enemy tests us into sin so that we can disobey God. But God tests us and God takes us through trials to build us up, to strengthen us, to make us more uh, closer to him, to bring us to a point where our walk with him is, uh, is we, we, we grow in our walk with him. Let me put it that way. That is the intention of God when he tests us, when he brings trials our way. And, and, and when James talks about it, he says, consider it pure joy when you come across trials and, ch and challenges. So when you come across a hard time or you're going through a difficult time, know that God is, is, is trying to strengthen you, to build you up, to make sure that you grow in your work with him. That is the intention of God. God wants us to, to grow in our work with him. And as he says in the book of Exodus, he says, the intention of my test is so that you will not sin. But the intention of temptation is that you will sin. And so it's clear that God does not want us to sin because God is against sin and God hates sin. And so when we are tempted, we must understand that part that God tries us and tests us to build our faith, to, to build us in our walk with him. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 4, talking about God as our father. It says, from verse 4 it says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And, you, and have you completely forgotten this word of, of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his, his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord's discipline, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Enjoy hardship as, as discipline. God is treating you as, as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not a legitimate, a legitimate, not true sons or daughters at all. Moreover, we all have had human fathers who discipline us and us and with respected, uh, we respected them. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they uh, thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No, discipline seems pleasant. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It gives us a picture of the father. And when we started the prayer, we said, who is God? God is our father. And it says when God deals with us, he does not deal with us with the intention to harm us. The intention is that we may be trained, that our muscles may be strengthened, that our muscles may be stronger, that when we walk with God, we walk with him as children who have uh, been strengthened by God and we are able to stand the test of time in our walk with him. That is the intention of God. So he's, he's building us up through trials, through challenges, through all of these things. But he's not testing us or tempting us to sin. He is not doing that at all. And I want us to see what happens when we are in the hands of the enemy. When we are in the hands of the tempter. And I want us to look at a few examples. We look at the first person. The, this guy is called Judas. We know about him. Judas, the son of Iscariot. It says in the book of Luke chapter 22 verse 3 uh, to 6. 
Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve. I want you to notice this. Satan entered Judas. That should give you an indication. Satan did what? Entered Judas. One of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priest and the, the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity for, to hand Jesus over to them then, uh, when no crowd was present. What happened? Satan, the tempter, did what? Entered Judas. And when he entered Judas, what happens? He leads Judas to go and betray Jesus. Because he is the, the tempter. And, and, and look what happens. In the book of Matthew 27, verse 3 to 5, when Judas had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied, we don't care. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The purpose of temptation is to lure you into something that is attractive. In this case, with Judas, is money. He is, 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 is attracted by the love of money and then it leads him ultimately to a point of death. As James says, that ultimately it leads to death. So Judas dies or hangs himself why? Because he allowed temptation to come into his heart and begin to mess around with him. Because the tempter entered into his heart. And that's what happens. And I want us to see one more person as we continue. Uh, Acts chapter 5 verse 3. It says, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart? That you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept to yourself some of the money you received for the land. What, did, what happened? Satan filled his heart. And what happened when he did that? He lied. What was the enticement? Money. He was lured away. And he looked at this like, I'm going to get so much money out of this. This is going to be good when I have this money. But what the devil is doing is that, no, he's not interested in the money. Temptation, the, the ultimate goal of temptation is not itself. Temptation is, is uh, uh, itself. The ultimate goal of temptation is to bring you to death, which is sin. That is the ultimate uh, intention of temptation. And so Satan was able to enter into, Pete, so, so, uh, into uh, Judas Iscariot. He was able to enter into Ananias and led them to a place where their lives were destroyed. Actually, both of them died. Because if you read further in, in this story, you, you realize that Ananias was buried because of this. And so ultimately, when we say, Lord, lead us not into temptation, the understanding is that God is not tempting us. We are tempted when the, the devil enters and throws an idea and throws a desire in our hearts. And when, our desire, when we, we entertain that desire, we entertain that, that, that uh, enticement, then we find ourselves in a position where we are led away from the ways of God. In James, once again, he says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But it says this, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own, their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's conceived, full grown, gives birth to death. And we've seen that picture in the examples that we have given. Ananias and Judas. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can enjoy it. 
So does God lead us into temptation? So when we pray, lead us not into temptation. We must be clear in our mind that God does not lead us into temptation. But rather, he does the, the opposite. He gives us the ability to be able to handle it and he provides a way of escape. Why? Because he does not want sin to destroy us. Then if he's not saying, if, if he's saying, lead us not into temptation, and then we are saying God does not lead us into temptation, what are we saying? <laughs> what are we saying is going on here? What we are saying here is that we are standing at a position where we know the facts. Fact number one, the tempter is the enemy. Temptation goes with Satan. <laughs> Fact number one, as we pray, lead us not into temptation. Fact number two, God does not tempt us. So he cannot lead us into temptation. Because he does not tempt us, right? But what we are saying is, we are holding a position where we are acknowledging the fact that, you know, this thing aims to destroy us. But Lord, when it does come our way, help us in it. Help us that we may come out of this thing alive. Because the ultimate idea is for it to destroy, to destroy us. And fact number three, did I say fact number three? Number four, number three, number four, number three. Okay. Fact number next is that. <laughs> fact number next is that we need to guard our hearts. Because we play a key role in how we respond to temptation. We pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Because we understand that God will give us the, the way, way out. He will give us the strength to handle it and deal with it and, and, and escape it. But our hearts are a key factor when it comes to temptation. You see, I said temptation comes to entice us. When it entices you, where is your heart? Do you entertain it? Do you look at what the devil is doing and begin to say, ah, no, no that, this looks good. Let, let, let's hear more of it. Let's hear more of it. In the book of, of, of Genesis, we see what happens in the, book of, uh, in, in, the, in the garden. The enemy comes to Adam and Eve, or to Eve, and he says to them, no, man, eat this thing. You know, this thing, this things look, this thing looks good, you know. What God said is not what he meant, but what he meant is actually this. That's what happens when, when temptation comes. The devil tries to come and twist God's word. He tells us, no man, this is, I mean, come on man. I mean, it's just, it's just the phone. You just take it, put it in your pocket. I mean, come on, it's just the phone. You know? No, 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 I mean, come on. It's just the, I mean, it's not a lot of money. Just take it, put it in your pocket. And go, you know? No, I mean, come on. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's just, Nothing much is going to come out of it, you know, but, <laughs> but what he knows is, what he's saying to you is say, make God a liar. If you are the son of God, as he tempts Jesus, if you are the son of God, is Jesus not the son of God? Does Jesus not know that he's the son of God? If you are the son of God. What is it trying to achieve? It's trying to say to Jesus, yeah, you know, doubt who you are. Doubt who God is. Doubt, doubt who, what you know about God. Doubt the truth about your existence. That is the idea. And that's how, what, that's what happens. And th therefore, what, what it means is that we need to make sure that we are rooted in God's word. And that is why we are trying to go through this scripture so that we understand ultimately what, it, what the word of God is saying. So that we are not lured by the enemy by telling us the lies that he tells us. So, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are dealing with two, with, with two kingdoms. The kingdom of the enemy and the kingdom of God. And when we look at the kingdom of God, we know that the kingdom of God has nothing to do with evil. 
the kingdom of the enemy, on the other hand, is aimed at destroying us and doing all of these evil things against us. And so when we say, deliver us from evil, we are saying, Lord, by our own strength, we cannot get out of this thing. We cannot get out of it. You know, we look at the story of Job. Job, Job goes through and he is tested. Or he's, t- he's tempted by the enemy. The enemy is trying to push him away from God. And they, they, we know the story of Job and we know what happens. But ultimately what happens at the end is that God doubles what Job lost. God gives Job everything else he has lost and even more. Gives us a clear indication of the fact that God is interested in the things that are for our own good. And we see that very same thing as Peter comes, Jesus says to Peter, you know what? The enemy actually wants to sift you like wheat. But he says to him, I have prayed for you. That you do not lose your faith. That your faith does not fail. I have prayed for you. And when you have you are strengthened, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your, your, your fellow believers. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I know that the devil wants to tempt you and eliminate you, but I have prayed for you. And he says to the disciples again, uh, pray so that you do not fall into temptation. So what he's, what he's saying is that temptation will come, but when it comes, you must be able to stand because there is this war that is going on between the flesh and the spirit. And what ultimately must win in the life of a believer is that the spirit must come out victorious. The things of the spirit and the the things of the flesh are conflicting against one another. And the flesh wants you to do what the flesh wants you to do to please the enemy. But the spirit, on the other hand, wants to please God. And therefore, the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And therefore, when we ask God, when we pray, we ask God to give us strength to deal with temptation. We are not saying God is a tempter. We are not saying God is leading us to uh, temptation to destroy us. We are not saying God is trying to harm us. We are saying, Lord, we acknowledge that temptation can destroy our lives. And we are saying, helpless as we are, we need you, Lord, to help us as we go through it. We need you to help us as we go through it. Because we know, we have established that from Genesis to Revelation, all you have for us is, actually, Jeremiah says, the plans that I have for you are not to harm you, but they are for your good. And so we ask God to help us, to give us strength, to enable us, to to help us to stay away from this thing called temptation that is aiming to destroy us. So we trust God to give us the strength we need to go through temptation. Temptation will be there. Temptation will always be there. And there's nothing wrong with being tempted. But there's something wrong with how we react to temptation. And God wants us to overcome when we are tempted. When the enemy comes and gives us a piece of uh, meat or whatever, to entice us into doing whatever that he wants us to do, we should be able to say, the Bible says, actually Peter says, resist the enemy and he will flee from you. So when we are tempted, our, our posture should be the posture of resistance. When he says, try this man, it's nice. Say, no, I resist. That is the posture we should, ha- we should hold. That, 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 that way we are able to find ourselves in a position where as we are tempted, we are able to overcome temptation because God is on our side to overcome the temptations that we come across. I will land it here uh, for the sake of time. Thank you very much. Father, we thank you this morning for your word that spoke to us, O Lord. Your word, O dear Jesus, that reminded us that you, Jesus, were tempted, but you never gave into sin. Thank you that this morning you have shown us in your word, O Lord, that you have given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And wherever we find ourselves, when the devil tries to enter us, that we must resist him in accordance with your word. We pray this morning, O oh Lord, that you help us to hide this word in our hearts, that when the evil one tempts us, O oh Lord, we may reflect on your word and stand 
against the evil one. Hallelujah.